Hey, how's it going, everybody? It's Todd Ledbetter with All Music, and today we got a very special guest today. We got Brother Sal here today. Everybody say hi to Brother Sal. How you doing? Hello. Thanks for being here today. It's so awesome you can jump on with us and uh, participate in uh, this YouTube channel, All Music, where we talk about all music. I love it. All right. Yeah, it's so cool. Uh, so... Um, we were just talking just before we started recording, just kind of remembering how we met. And I, I've seen you play a couple times here in town and uh, at Zoe's. And that, that was a great venue. And Great venue. Uh, yeah, great venue. Great people. Yeah, great people. Yeah. Yeah. Is there any way you can turn your volume up a little bit on your mic? Is that sure, possible for you? Let me yeah. see. Um, let me go to that real quick. I've done this like four times. I know it's kind of new to me too, and I'm I'm kind of learning as I roll. And I uh, learned to make sure the volume was up on the guest. <laughs> let me see. Uh, down. There we go. Let's try this. Is that better? Yeah, that's good. I think that okay. should work. Yeah, yeah. I don't hear myself in my 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 headphones, so I can't really hear the balance but um last time i did this at work it was perfect and it sounded similar so yeah so uh anyways um i'm no live music going on right now that's that's no. obvious but uh what, what have you been doing during this downtime for me i've i've been asked by a lot of people uh i mean my live show is kind of what people you know kind of know me for yeah. uh me and my band for uh, you know, when are you going to do a Zoom show? When are you going to do some sort of, you know, program so we can watch you play the piano? But I'm actually sort of against it if mm. I had, to, you know, if I had to be honest with you. Only because my reaction and how I play music involves people being there. Yeah. So, you know, like I pick up a guitar right now, take myself over to my piano, play a song for you, but uh, the room. Yeah. And the sounds from everyone else, and not just like in your ears that you're listening to play stuff and whatnot. Um, it really, you know, I close my eyes when I play the piano, when I <laughs> sing live or whatnot, and I'm just kind of listening to it. Listen to crowd noise, you listen to your band playing or whatnot. That reaction is not there for me. And yeah. so I find it sort of difficult. So what I have been doing, though, is I had an idea couple of years ago, discussed it with my guitarist, um, or one of my guitarists, uh, Dave Immergluck. Um, and we had planned on, on making a record before this all started, right? I had these songs uh, that I've written over the last, I mean, I might be giving myself away and betraying what I'm doing here, but over the last four years, say 2016, I started writing certain songs about the world and this country and different folks in charge and whatnot. But um, when this happened, it took me a good two, three weeks to kind of get into the process of like, oh, maybe this is the perfect time. Like maybe I'm not gonna do a show, but maybe this is the perfect time to actually make a record. And it's still being worked out in terms of like how I'm gonna do it. That piano that's in my house, I've had my whole life. It was in my grandmother's house. When I would come to visit her, she was the first person to put me on that piano. Uh, when I was three years old, she taught me my first songs on that piano. And it's never been on a record. I've never recorded it. Mm. So I thought to myself, well, maybe now is the perfect time. I don't have access to, I mean, I have keyboards and, and organs and stuff like that over here. But, you know, like, all my other pianos that I own are in different spots around Los Angeles and there's yeah. no access to them. There's no, so, okay, maybe I'll do that. Um, but there's a big, obviously community of musicians that I'm a part of here in town. And we've been discussing recording because it's affecting musicians everywhere, not just live shows. I'm talking like studio musicians. Sure. You know, in Los Angeles, you're in the entertainment capital of the world. And these people are used to, three, four gigs a day to yeah. record in an orchestra, to record here, to record there and whatnot. And that doesn't happen. So we've been discussing doing the record sort of piecemeal here at some studios where we can distance um, ourselves from each other. Or maybe, you know, we, we do uh, bass tracks. I don't like to do the records like that, but um, I think 
it's it's cool. I think I've got the idea. I think it's all processed. And um, so now it's just a like on me and and the rest of the guys to make it happen. So yeah. that's like my whole day. And it still feels like for the majority of what this is for most of you know public out there, <clears throat> it feels weird not to get up, take a shower, eat breakfast, walk out the door, go to work. But for me. My normal MO as anyways is to get up, write a song, be here, drink coffee, whatever, you know. Yeah. So there's not for me, it's not a big transition. Yeah. The one thing that has gotten to me is half of what I do when I write a song or half of what I do when uh, I've, I've got a record idea in mind is be able to go outside and sit and listen and observe humanity. Yeah. Be in public and just be there, not talk, don't say anything, listen to conversations. Um, and so that's the only thing. So these these sort of calls are actually important to talk to people. You know what I mean? Um, and I hate FaceTime. I hate the Zoom thing. But now I understand, like, all right, if that's where I'm going to get it from. That's where we're at. So all of that hasn't really changed for me in terms of like, oh, I decided to make a record but how to do it and how to get the inspiration of like where, what I want a songs feel sonically or, you know, vibe wise to take shape. That's something I'm trying to find in a new place. Um, but it's been good. It's been working. And I play the piano more during these last two months than I probably have. I mean, just for my own self, yeah. I would just, Oh, I got a show tonight. I'll go to my show. I show up. I don't even know what I'm playing. Let's play this kind of thing. This is like a very specific practice period that I haven't had in a long time. So it's been good, you know? Yeah, um, I, I'm sort of doing the same thing because I'm not working right now. So I'm sort of doing other things to try to keep taking, I'm trying to be active, active in some ideas that I've had over the years. And this right. is one of them that I really wanted to do for quite a while. And I was going to start it before this all happened. And then I was going to do live interviews and, and go to people's studios and wherever they wanted to meet. And then, right. and then, well, I finally, it took me a while to figure out, Oh, I can transition into the zoom thing and make, make that happen. So I understand it took, takes a little while to readjust, you know, and, and how things are going to work. Yeah. You know? How long have you had this idea to do this show? Well, I've had it for, for a long time. I've wanted to do something like this, but more recently, it's been about probably like, uh, probably about a year. Yeah. Yeah. And I just haven't had the energy with work and, and uh, just I've been doing other things. And so finally now with time, I finally put this on the front burner to try to, you know, make something happen uh, among other things as well. So, um, and it's getting a pretty good response, uh, from people that, you know, I don't really know, but I've heard yeah. of and, um, people that I do know. And, uh, so, and I'm getting, getting a little bit better at it as I go. Um, but I, I actually, I used to want to be a, a radio broadcaster, you know, back when I was younger and I actually went to school to, uh, really? yeah, to get certified back in the day. <clears throat> But then I listen back to myself when I do this and I've got, and I, I laugh at my speech pattern and the way I talk, I'm like, well, you don't sound like a DJ, you know, and right. you kind of mix up your words and uh, I'm like, oh, well, it doesn't matter. I don't care because I'm just going to be who I am and we're going to do this thing. And it's not about yeah. me. It's about, it's about the guests and I want to feature the music and, and um, you're an, uh, you're an awesome performer. I've seen you perform yeah. twice. And uh, when you were here locally, and uh, it, I was floored. I was really amazed at uh, uh, not only your performance ability, but the skill level of your musicianship and the songwriting and crafting. And and uh, you were with a band both times. And just the talent that you had with you was just incredible. They're the best. Yeah. My band is the best. I swear it. I'll put them up. It's like some old school, high school, like American Legion uh, band competition. I'd put them up against anyone in the world. I no, promise no you. No doubt. That. Name any band, I'd put them up there. Just yeah. because they are, when we found each other, when we all found each other, we had a distinct love for the same feel on stage. Mm -hmm. We had a distinct love for what I was doing. They love what I was doing. I love what they were doing. And we did it together. No, there's no ego involved whatsoever. I'm sure there's anger involved. 
there's anger on my part involved all the time. But it was one of those things like we're going to do it for the beauty of the music, not for like glorification or adulation for ourselves. And that works itself to be the most magical thing that's out there. And so like, you know, if you had told that guy I was mentioning, my guitarist, Dave Emmergluck, if you had told me, you know, I guess I met him 10, 12 years ago. If you told me that the guitarist, one of the like founding members of the Counting Crows would be in my band, I would have thought you were ridiculous. And not because I don't like the Counting Crows, but in my head, the Counting Crows, number one, I never listened to them. They weren't somebody that was on my radar. Uh, at that time, I listened to very different sort of music. And um, I had a certain person in mind that listened to the Counting Crows. And mm -hmm. I was not him. And mm -hmm. I was not that person. And when, he, when we met, I remember like thinking to myself, this dude's got a lot of hair gel. <laughs> like, <laughs> he wears a bendy. You know what I mean? Like... He's oh, he might might be of like the elitist class because he's from San Francisco area, Bay Area is like like very, you know, um, very specific type of dude. And he 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 said something to me it was like, hey, let's go up to let's go up to the Bay Area and start a Meters cover band. And he didn't know it, but I was like, oh man, the Meters are one of my favorite bands of all time, and that's what I'm talking about. Is like, uh the commonality that we all share. There's like very specific music acts with each one of us that like doesn't jive with somebody else, but those are few and far between. And the thing about it is like, we, we know those acts, people don't like a certain person, people don't like a certain <laughs> voice or, uh, you know, uh, musician, and we all make fun of each other just for not like, you know, all of us usually like one person and then like a drummer, my drummer doesn't like, this person right so um we have fun with it but it's always after the show when we're on stage it's like you know i i have no idea how it works but you can tell though uh when the players are having a good time up there on stage and they're not just up there just kind of phoning it in you know right. yeah and uh as a matter of fact um can i play a video uh right now yeah. that shows you looks like you're uh doing in a studio with your players and you can actually see how much everybody's enjoying themselves sure. playing your music let me just um pull that up so this is uh brother sal a good-hearted man let's uh play that <laughs> A hard hearted woman, and I don't know who's wrong or what is right. I hold her in in the bright of the sunshine, and I'll turn my back in the black of the night. choose to love somebody
with a hard heart and warm And I don't care who's wrong or what is right. I hold her hand in the bright of the sunshine. And I come back home in the bright. That was an awesome song. That was an Thank awesome you, song. How long has it been since you've seen that video? <laughs> uh, that's a good question. I mean, good... at least a couple of months. Yeah. That's I like to go one. back. I'm not one of those guys who's going to act like he doesn't listen to his own stuff or yeah. fake, like, you know, like I don't watch myself. Yeah. Um, I watched the video. I don't, maybe I don't watch it all the way through, but it comes up a lot. Not that video. Uh, per se but like just videos in general youtube when your people ask you for things sort of like this yeah you know I mean? so i'll go and and find it or something like that and then i'll send it out or whatever um that record or that song isn't on a record that i put out it's recorded it's done there's a you know there's a couple records that i haven't put out that i have the music to and they're all ready to go i just haven't put that record out but one of the ideas um, that we've been discussing is putting that out as like an EP, putting like a good hearted man EP out, a couple other songs, 
that people always ask me for and they're not available to buy. So my only issue is that I, the thing is with that song, like I love it. Uh, and, and I've recorded two versions of it. One was a demo version. I was like, I had some, like I had a trip to New York for a week with uh, one of my buddies planned and I wrote that song. I finally came up with that opening line. That was the big thing about that song is that uh, like I needed a good opening line because I wrote it sort of like in the vein of like old 60s stacks, soul records, 60s, 70s. And every one of those songs, no matter if you're talking about Aretha or Marvin Gaye or whoever, all have this great line that catches you right from the top. And I had written the melody. I had kind of like a, you know, a kind of an idea of uh, what I wanted to write it about, but I needed a line. And it took me forever to write the line. And the minute I got the line, I wrote the song in 10 minutes. I wrote it, I mean, it was that, it was that easy. The minute, I just needed that first line. And, um, so I, I loved it so much that I actually called the band and said, I'd like to go to the studio before I get on this plane and demo it. And the demo is awesome. It, it's great. I actually had a, a, one of my best friends play drums on it. The guy who's playing drums on that record is not our normal drummer, but our normal drummer was back in Denmark where he's from. And um, so essentially the guy who shot the video, uh, another buddy of mine, said i love the song so much i'd like to make a video and i was like oh i got no money for that right now he's like oh don't worry about it like so i thought about it i was like well i'll record the song that was what that was what it was he said i'll i'll pay for the studio time for you guys to record the song and shoot a video and wow. so we were like i can't turn that down I'm like, yeah I down. why would you get yeah. forth in the mouth kind of thing so um so in my head it sounds great it's, it's a great sound. It's a good looking video. It sounds really cool. But as is true with most things that we do, we explore on stage. We don't really explore in the studio. We stay in the studio three, four days. That's it. We record songs. And as they, as you hear them is, is what we did live. And it's usually four or five of us playing together. It's not like, let's, let's do a lot of uh, overdubs and stuff like that. You know, we want to give it about as, as much authenticity as we can. So, we played that song five times and basically uh, the engineer uh, who's my partner on this whole thing comped a version together for the video and that's what you hear and the version is great but in my head I'm like man it's missing horns I want that <laughs> choir you know what I mean like I want the choir to sound like a gospel choir I got this bigger like more expansive version of it um, but that doesn't mean that I can't do that version at some other time. Yeah. Um, and so what I was thinking of, you know, I, but I had to like resolve that in my head. And so what I'm thinking is like, well, I'll put it out as an EP. And if I just choose to record it again in a bigger, grander setting, then I'll do it. And it's fine. And I don't mind putting songs out. It's like, oh, this song moved from where it started and now it's here. And the majority of those things is like, if you go back to my Blood and Dust record, I made it sort of piecemeal with a few good buddies of mine, but the only member of my actual band who's on Blood and Dust is Johnny, uh, my bass player, who's in that video. And everyone else is like buddies. You know, I had like four or five guitarists, I had four different drummers, uh, and they're all people who play with me, but they're not part of the actual band. So in my head, I was like, I could record the Blood and Dust record over again with my five guys and turn out the version of the songs that we've been playing together for 10 plus years, completely different record, all told, you know what I mean? Um, because those songs move to a different place. They move to a different speed. They move to a different like timbre, whatever. Um, so I'm proud of the video. I'm proud of the song, yeah. but in my head, I'm just like, I'm just waiting to record it and get it to the masterpiece I want it to be. You know what I mean? So. Yeah, well, it's funny because a lot of times, you know, people, they record their album and there it is. That's the version you hear. But in, in the opposite um, aspect of what you're saying is then, then you hear the same song years later by the same band, but they're playing it live. Right. And now, they, now they're exploring Right. So and you go, wow, no, you got to hear the live version. You know, you got to hear the live. Right. Version. 
Right. And so, so yeah, you know, it makes sense um, totally that uh, songs evolve over time or, or, you know, with who you have, you can create yeah. it in a different aspects. So yeah, I look forward to that because I can hear what you're saying with horns and that's what my son's doing right now on his band is he's, he's uh, waiting for the keyboard player that plays the sax to, he's super busy. So he can only come in for like one song at a time, Right. you know? So it's just, and then with this whole virus, it's yeah. stretching things out, but uh, boy, when he had this, adds his parts, it just really makes a huge difference. Makes you the know? whole difference, right? Yeah. 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 That's so, it. It's like some of my people will, people know, you know, who are some of you, they'll ask me about my influences. They'll say, oh, um, oh, you're a huge Springsteen fan. I don't know anything about him, right? This is a for instance, basically. Uh, oh, yeah, Springsteen, one of my early influences. I loved him. You know, my father's from New Jersey. My whole family, my, ho my father's whole family's from New Jersey and, and whatnot. And uh, tell me what record to start with. And I inevitably always want to say, start with his live 75 to 85 record. But you can't do that with people because they're not, in the you know they haven't started they don't know born to run they don't know born of the usa they don't know darkness on the edge of town nebraska these songs so you'd be going in there with no you you have no idea what he's about anyway so you have to give him the studio records but i think if you ask bruce springsteen he'd be like play my live stuff for him you know what i mean that's that's where the the band really shines that's where the music really shines is the band you know puts it to life. Yeah. It to life, actually, huge no matter what those songs are. And so people will say, what's your favorite record of his? And I'll say, it's that live record, the live three disc record. It's on my, it's on, I have it in my, all my vinyl and stuff like that. I've had it forever. It's his best record because it's, you know, his first record all the way down to, I want to say the born in the USA record, but it's all these songs that, you know, in a different setting, in a different you know, perform differently or whatnot. And I love it. I just think it's the best way to hear Bruce Springsteen, you know? Yeah. Um, anyway. Yeah. yeah, that's, that's really cool. Um, uh, a lot of people bring up the boss when they're talking about influences I've noticed. Um, and for good reason, you know? Yeah. Yeah. He, uh, <clears throat> It is, a, I, I noticed something, I'm not from California. When I moved to California many years ago, I noticed that there was sort of a West Coast, East Coast bias in terms of like who you're listening to. But if you found somebody who was like born and raised on the West Coast and would say, I'm interested in the history of music, so I'll listen to all of it, right? So I was fortunate enough that the first like real good friends I made, two brothers, their dad was a giant music fan, born and raised in like bourbon, right? But he was like, let me hip you to this Jethro Tull record. Let me hip you to this uh, Wet Willie record. Let me hip you to this, you know. And he was one of those guys who was like, I'm not going to hold anything back. I'll give you all the music as I think it's good. And because I just remember meeting person after person who was like, yeah, I don't listen to Blue Springsteen. Just as I have friends to this day who are like from Texas who won't listen to like Billy Joel. Because Billy Joel doesn't translate whatsoever. You know what I mean? Like yeah. the whole New York, like sort of jazzy, tinged, pop, influenced rock and roll doesn't make sense to somebody who grew up listening to country music on the radio. Right. So it's interesting uh, when you're talking music with people, those people who have kind of got to the heart of the matter and, and got to the meat of the subject or whatnot, it's like, yeah, Bruce wrote good songs. He wrote really great classic songs. You're gonna remember the melodies, you're gonna remember the words, you know? And that's other level, that's other, you know, you have to study those people. And so if you hear a lot of people talk about it, that's the reason, as far as I'm concerned, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, there is no like singular place of like, oh, nostalgia for me, where my cousin Jennifer was like, who was a straight Jersey girl. I mean, just a, who is a Jersey girl. She was like, yo, she knew every boss record. She had been to a million shows. She didn't like it when he stopped talking about the songs. He wanted, she wanted to hear every story he had to sell, tell, you know. <laughs> there is no nostalgia with that for me. It's just like, at some point, you have to be objective and be like, these songs are great. And I can't, there's, I can't pull any punches here, you know? 
Yeah, when I, I, I mentioned when I was in broadcasting school and uh, one of the guys I was hanging around with, he was a huge Bruce fan. And we would go over to his house and he uh, would play all the uh, records in Nebraska and all that. Yeah. And But then, but then um, to counterpoint that, the singer in my band, he, he told me, a while like a couple of years ago he goes he, he's just not a fan of bruce right. springsteen and i go how can you not be a fan and um he says well to me it just sounds like he's always searching for a melody <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but I, 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 searching for everything yeah. whether that be a car a woman a place to lay his head all of that that's the whole thing you know? yeah yeah, yeah. He's out, yeah, but uh, I was just on a Bruce Springsteen kick probably like three months ago. I was just like diving into all kinds of stuff, just wanting to just hear it and just familiarize myself. Do you find that there's a sort of stubborn, obstinate thing with a lot of folk where they're like, I'm dug in. I'm just not going to explore any further oh, yeah. than I want to, you know? Well, one of the biggest examples I have, and I'm a prog rock kind of guy in, right. in some ways, uh, and I'm a huge Genesis fan. Great band. And I go back to their very first record, which um, was, is very different from anything else. But then their second record, they started kind of getting into who they were with Peter Gabriel, and they got Steve Hackett, and then when Phil Collins was on drums, and and uh, and you get that sort of resistance soon as soon as Peter Gabriel left. Mm -hmm. A lot of fans, hardcore fans, were like, "No, it's not yeah. anymore." And then when Steve Hackett left, right, that was it. That's it. That was it. There is no. That is not Genesis anymore. You know. And then right. there were three, which I really love. The next three, four albums, you know. And then they started getting kind of poppy, and I still liked the songs at the time, you know. But then yeah. there came a point where I sort of stopped buying the albums, and then I would hear it on the radio, and. And then a few months ago, I went back and kind of listened to some of those later Genesis albums. And what I thought, uh, which the, the albums that were Genesis albums and all those hit songs that were Genesis, I thought it was Phil Collins songs. Right. You know, it was very Phil Collins. And I, so I was like, oh, wow, that was Genesis. I thought that was Phil Collins the whole time. Yeah. And, um, but yeah, you get, I'm on like some forums and Facebook groups, Genesis fans, and, and there's heated debate. And then you get to yeah. the point where, their last studio album that was uh, calling all stations and they had Ray Wilson as the lead vocalist. Oh my God. You know, all hell's going to break loose now because that is not Genesis to people, you know? Right. And it was, I love that album. I mean, I'm like a whole era fan of Genesis. I think he's a great singer and I think the songs are great, but people will debate you. They'll fight you to the death. People want familiarity. Yeah. That's what they want. They want, that's why they don't go anywhere. You know, I had an uncle and an aunt who I love dearly. Some of the two of the most, uh, they're both dead now, but two of the greatest personalities you ever met. You know what I mean? Who were born and raised in Jersey City, New Jersey. You know what I mean? Yeah. Five minutes across a river is New York City. They never went there. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. And music for me is like, you've got to have an objectivity to it. You can't be subjective. You can't be like, I like this and only this. And I learned that not with Genesis, but something along the same lines is with the band uh, with Van Halen. Yeah. Because Van Halen has the same kind of thing. The minute David Lee Roth leaves, there's no way I'm listening to Sammy Hagar. And then there's people who are like, I didn't like David Lee Roth. I mm -hmm. like Sammy Hagar. And you have these like people who take these stances on something that's really just math. Good songs are great math. That's yeah. what it is. So you get into like, say for you, Invisible Touch. You probably heard that record and you were like, that's really poppy. That's a really, really poppy record, right? It is. And that's not where Genesis started from. They started no. in a different era of music. But music from 1975 to 1985 went how many different places? Oh, I know. Formation of hip hop. You had disco and clubs for years. You know what I mean? Yeah. You had punk show up you had all these things that were just like musicians are influenced too they're listening sure to they songs are. too and they're sitting there you know it's like i didn't i knew i knew that um the genesis record that's all right 
But I thought it was Phil Collins because I was a kid. I was like six or seven when that record came out. 1984, I think that was. Yeah, um, 82, 83, something like that. Anyway, I was I was six or seven and eight. Mm-hmm. I was seven and 82. And the thing is, like that record came out, immediately thought it was just Phil Collins. Some somebody at some point corrected me, said no, that's Genesis. All right, cool. Who's Genesis? Doesn't matter. <laughs> and then Genesis came back out with Invisible, Invisible Touch, and I grew up in Europe. I grew up with European radio. I didn't grow up with American radio. So Phil Collins and Genesis was bigger there. They just are because they're an English band. You get more airplay, you know? So I heard that record. I loved it because you and I right now could just start singing lyrics. And that's the math I'm talking about. It's simplified math that happens to a musician. It's like one, four, five happens one, two, five, one, two, five, four, whatever it is. And these things that people consider popular or something that popped in their head from radio and whatnot, they remember it and they never want to lose it. And the minute you take away from that and add something in, no, 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 I can't deal with that. I can, I can only deal with the familiar um, thing that I'm used to. And so I had to argue against myself for Sammy Hagar when it came to Van Halen, because I'm a giant David Lee Roth fan. I'm a, I think that Van Halen, and this is funny because they have no influence on my music whatsoever, right. but I think that Van Halen is like an anomaly, a little blip in musical history because they don't really come from anywhere. Yeah. There wasn't something prior to Running With The Devil that sounded like Running With The Devil. It was Van Halen, it was Eddie Van Halen specifically loving classical music and trying to incorporate it into a really heavy guitar. But they don't sound like anything. And David didn't sound like any of those songs sounded sort of weird, but they're they can be played on an acoustic guitar. They're that poppy, they're that, that accessible. And then Sammy came along and I I thought to myself that he doesn't have David's voice and I don't like these, but then I had to go back and say, You're wrong. Finish what you started is a great song. And so these things like started, you know, I'm I'm a teenager by this point. And and for me, then it became like, I need to actually pay attention to all of it. I can't just be relegated to one spot and stay there. You'll never grow. You'll never expand as a musician or a person, you know? So I, I would make fun of my aunt and uncle and I'd be like, go across the river. Go, hey, Uncle Jerry, you're going down to the bar. I know you're going to the bar. Aunt Norma knows you're going to the bar. Do me a favor. Get in the car with me and my cousin. Let's go to a bar in New York City. Nah, man, can't do it. I like the beer at my bar where it's cold and I'm used to it. I can smoke, you know what I mean? New York City has all these rules about smoking, all that stuff. They just want familiar and they want what they want. So anyways, I hope that we as people, I, that's my hope for all people, is that they will open their minds to be as expansive as they can be, whether it's for music or walking out of the city they were born and raised in, you know? <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I'm doing a lot of that right now. Um, as far as exploring music um, and kind of introducing myself even to old music that I didn't listen to before, yeah. kind of going back and revisit and, and things like that. But I think one thing we can all agree with Van Halen, um, and fortunately for me, I was a Sammy Hagar fan already. Right. So, I, of- I, it, so that came across way different to me because I was right. already a huge Sammy Hagar fan. But I think one thing we can all agree on is Sammy Hagar, I mean, I mean, Van Halen with Gary Sharon didn't, <laughs> didn't work. <laughs> Terrible. I'm not even sure how that, how that happened or why. I remember, I, because when MTV still played the news, I remember seeing that on, and like, Kurt Loder announced it. And I was like, what? What, yeah. like, what just happened? How did that, how was that a fit, you know? I don't know. It didn't, I mean, yeah. it sounded like, I heard the album and it sounded like he was trying to sound like Sammy and, just, but the songs weren't good, and I don't know. Some people liked it, but I just, I, I couldn't, I couldn't. Do like, it. yeah, I know you're a rock singer, but you come from a very different place than yeah. what Van Halen and Van Halen. How they started off, you know, um, they're just unique. I use them all the time as an example. It's like I can't point to their style. You can point to styles from where every musician comes from. Here's who he's influenced by. Here's who she's influenced by here's who raised this person came up with this person you know everyone from sinatra to kendrick lamar i mean whoever doesn't matter 
but Van Halen just doesn't sound like anything prior to. But then after, a lot of people sounded like them. Nothing prior to Van Halen coming out in 77, 78, with Van Halen 1. It's like, and it's weird because it's, for me, it doesn't speak to anything like, I need you to know this band because they're so important to me. No, I just love their songs. I, you know, yeah. it makes me think of radio in the 80s and stuff mm -hmm. like that and sure. fun times and, and the way MTV looked back. There's nothing special to me about them, but they are pretty unique in that you can't point and say, you know, I was listening to uh, every day. I send my sons, I have a 17 and a 15 year old. Every day I send them a record. Kind of do like, we're not doing singles. We're not doing like, here's a great song from 1987. I'm doing a record, like make them listen to a record. It's the only criteria I have is their father. And it's not for anything other than like, take 45 minutes to yourself and listen to a piece of art created, right? So yesterday, I wanted to point out the difference. I wanted to send him a, Mick Ronson's first record, right? Mm, yeah. And I wanted to show him how influenced he was by playing with Bowie. That first record, there's like a million places that just sound like I played with David Bowie for the last four years. I'm, I was his guitarist or whatnot. I wanted to show that. And I got to another record, but today I was actually able to do it because little richard died yeah and so i was able to say the record i sent them today was his first record here comes little richard right which opens with tutti frutti and in the middle of the record is my favorite little richard song which is slipping and sliding and i was able to give him this long dissertation <laughs> about all the people who he was like all the people that came after him and sounded like him or were brought up by him or were influenced by him or people that he helped along the way. And so anyways, the point is I was able to, uh, that's, those are the points for these stories I send my record, or I send my sons, records I send my sons, is I want them to understand how if it's going correctly, it's a beautiful river that just keeps on like picking up stuff from the riverbank and just like floating along. And no matter where you are listening, you should always be able to like grab something and say, I've never listened to this before. Let's see if I can throw it in and it makes sense to me. Or I can see where it came from, see where, you know, how long it had to travel to get to where it is right now. Um, so I didn't get to use Mick. I'll use Mick Ronson's record at some point, but uh, Little Richard was probably the best way to, to say it because it sort of started the whole rock and roll thing, you know? Um, yeah. Anyways, you yeah, don't understand why sometimes some people they they just insist they don't like a certain band or whatever. And I've, I've noticed lately in the, over the last few years, it, and the Beatles is a good example of that, yeah. where people uh, sort of almost like the Beatles are almost starting to get forgotten in a way. Yeah. Um, and people say, I don't like the Beatles. And I think, how can you not like right. the Beatles? I mean, they are a different band almost in every album. You know, why can't yeah. you find something in the Beatles that you don't, that, that you actually like? Yeah. Um, I mean, it, I like it because, you know, I love to just follow the progression, you know, and say, wow, look at, look at this from there. And then they went here from there and things like that. I have a different view, but some people are just like, no, I don't like the Beatles. It's like, really? I mean, you can't think of one song of the Beatles right. that you like. That's not, that's not true. I have a couple of, I have a, 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 a friend I've known for a long time. He's always maintained that and I, we would just make fun of him. We would just be like, dude, you're just doing this to be different. Yeah. You're just doing this because you don't want to fall into the mold of like, look, what's popular, what's pop or whatever, is a, there's a reason for it. Like billions of people can't be wrong. You yeah. can't take this one band. I used to argue with people and say, there's one Beatles song that I don't like. Right. And people would be like, what's your point in saying that? I'm like, that's how good they were. That's how amazing. That's how influential their music was to me. And the funny thing about it is like, I actually like that song. now. That one song that I could point to be like, oh, I never really got that song or whatever. But I've had these people, e either fans or friends or whatever, who just I don't know if it's just a need to be 
unique, a yeah. need to be different than everyone else out there. It's like, it's okay. You can just say, me too. I yeah. love the Beatles. They're amazing because they are. And yeah. just like you said, the place that they started and where they ended up, You've got to be able to find something in that mix. Yeah, You've got to be able to, that huge mess of songs. There's something in there for you, you yeah. know? Yeah. yeah. It's true. And it kind of reminds me of sort of how we started the conversation when you sort of met with your guitar player and, and how yeah. you guys, you know, weren't thinking that you guys were going to mesh, you know? And it's just like, I think, and then all of a sudden you start talking about bands and it's like, yeah, 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 that, that's what I'm into too. And yeah. with the with the Beatles, I think people don't like them because they just don't bother to listen to them, even though you can yeah. hardly get away from it on the radio. You know, yeah. more and more, radio is not a thing, yeah. Especially for young people, and so they're not Spotifying these things, you know, and they're not they're not checking out this this older music. They're just listening to what's current, you know, what's current, and what's current now is for is way different as yeah there's musical styles the way it's produced the way it's written it's you know there's no interludes there's no musicality it's just all go 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 yeah. go you know it's all math there's yeah. no feel it's all math yeah it's like I, there this is what's popular it'll stick in your head mm -hmm. we'll tell you we'll ram it down your throat you'll enjoy it you'll buy it period yeah it's all math there's no feeling to it and there's nobody who wrote it it's yeah. like a collective wrote it it's like a group of you know, older guys in a room, yeah. older women in a, whoever wrote it, you know what I mean? Whatever. But yeah. um, the thing about that, that, that you're talking about is sort of interesting is um, I, uh, I was most influenced and this is always sort of, you know, people kind of look at me and go, really? I was most influenced by hip hop. And so people listen to my music, they don't hear anything, but, when I would come to visit my family on a summer vacation, like I heard what New York City sounded like in 1981, mm -hmm. right? That's where I grew, like, that's where my family was. So I grew up listening. I want to hear what's on the radio then. And hip hop just spoke to me. It just did. It was like, this is a truly important art form. It's like, these people are saying what the, their plight looks like. Before I could even verbalize that before I, I could even say that so i've been listening to hip-hop my whole life six seven years old i started listening to it and it was one of those things like where everyone else was listening to certain bands or certain phases that came along whether it be heavy metal which i listen to heavy metal or grunge and i listen to grunge or whatever where pop and synth started electronic music started molding itself into the 90s like I you know and then getting to where we're at now I've always listened to hip-hop and the thing about it that's interesting is like there's a lot of places I could point to right now would be like that's not hip-hop that's not rap right now what comes out right now yeah yeah no for sure but there's still a good amount of it that is there's still new stuff that comes out that's really good. That's really, you know, powerful. That really still holds through 30 years of tradition and whatnot. It's a matter of, like you said, people not taking the time to expand. Yeah. And, and seek and it, out. it yeah. out there, you know, yeah. so. There's a, there's a couple of that, you know, I told you that I was, I've kind of been exploring music, older music and new music. And there's a, mm -hmm. a YouTube guy that has a music channel and he doesn't play any music, but he just talks about the music and the things he grew up with and what he likes. And, and it's like, you know, I've never heard that album or I've never really gotten into that band. So I started exploring it sort of through his suggestions. Right. And then another guy I watch, he's a black guy and he's like 40, I think. Mm -hmm. And, you know, raised on hip hop, you know, raised on rap, raised on R and B. And he's playing music from, he's playing rock and roll and he's playing um, uh, progressive rock and, and uh, pop music from the seventies and the eighties and right. sort of reacting to it, you know, and he's, it's just a joy to watch this guy discover this music from being so like pigeonholed into rap right. and that's all and, and R and B. He, he never knew. I mean, I love R and B too, but I mean, he never knew any of this other stuff and he's, he's, 
he's reading the lyrics and he's watching these people perform and he's blown away and just watching his reaction and the enjoyment he's getting from it is just fun for me to see. And he's got a huge following, almost three, I think 300,000 people on YouTube. And he's got the best community, man. Just in the comments, people are so cool. And just like, Hey, if you like that, you got to check this one out. Right. Oh, oh, you're going down the rabbit hole with this band. Check out all these songs from this band. And, and right. he does it. And it's just a real joy to see somebody expand their mind and their music. I love culture. that. Yeah. It's really that's a good. great idea, man. I yeah. mean, that's funny you say that. Two two days ago for my sons, I sent them the Kraftwerk second record. Mm. And I, sometimes I don't like to preface anything. Sometimes I'll do a whole long diatribe, whole long, like, you know, speech in sending them the record. But I didn't want to say much about Kraftwerk's record. Uh, and so my son, my oldest son, texted me. was like, what the heck did I just listen to? <laughs> and I knew it would hit my younger son in a different way because it's computers and video games. It sounds like the stuff that he loves. But my other son, you know, my oldest son is listening to it and just is like, I have no clue what this is. And I go, but if you go to their first record and you go to their third record, you put two songs together, listen to Planet Rock by Africa Mabata. And he tripped out. And I was like, it comes from all sorts of different places. Mm -hmm. You'd be really surprised. And the best music, isn't something that you think to yourself, this is new. I came up with No, you didn't. No, you didn't. There's nothing that doesn't come from. That's why Van Halen, that whole Van Halen thing is such an interesting place to me because you can't really grab onto something that influenced them. But so with that, it's, it's like, for me personally, what I do isn't necessarily that I was born a great writer or that, um, I, de I definitely believe I was gifted a talent on the piano. Like I just, I know the amount that I practiced and the amount that I should practice or mm -hmm. whatever. And I just don't, right. I just was like, I understand it. I see the keys. They make sense. I got a lot of motion in my fingers, whatever it is. But my talent for me that I think that I possess is the ability to want to hold on to sonics. So I am a, this library. I mean, if you've been to a couple of shows, you know that I'll just sit there and say, ask me to play something or give me, I'll take requests tonight or something like that. And I'll just play it. And I just have that, like, I've never w thought to myself, okay, I've reached my limit of where this library can be. I just don't look at things like that. I really fully believe that the best art, no matter what it is, music or painting or whatever your medium is, comes from more, more, as much as you can add in there. And the great thing about the brain and the great thing about the human body, the human soul, the condition, whatever, is that you can never add enough. You can just keep on expanding and, and throwing stuff in there. The library gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And so for me, it's like I actually hold it as a badge of honor that I am this library of song, that I am a library of song that goes back hundreds of years you know and i'm never going to stop and i've had these points in life where like i listened to nothing but music from the 40s i drove around for months in cars listening to 40s big band swing and people would be like what are you listening to and that was it that for me it was like this is what is moving me for the next like three and a half months you know uh, and it's not like I'm saying, oh, everybody should be like this. I'm just saying, for me, that's always what worked. And so when I go to write a song, I've got these melodies in my head that don't come from myself, that come from somebody else, you know. And I love to be able to point back to a song like Good Hearted Man or something else I've written and say, this is what I based that song off of. Mm. Or this is what I was, like, feeling, what I had in my head when I wrote that song. So... You gotta pay it forward, right? What's that? You gotta pay it forward, right? Right, yeah, yeah. And just having all those influences too. I mean, people say, you know, are you a half, uh, are you a, a glass half full guy or a right. glass half empty guy? And I always answer, no, my glass is overflowing. Right. And so that's where you just take all the influences, like you were saying, and you just you just keep adding. It doesn't matter if it's spilling out. That's kind right. of what you want. That's the point. You want it. You want to contain it, and then you want it to spill out. You know. Yeah. You want other people to share it. Yeah. Yeah. 
Well, listen, Sal, we're, we're like over an hour and uh, <laughs> this is awesome. And I sure appreciate the conversation and um, I look forward to uh, seeing you again. I'm going to make sure I follow you on Facebook so I, I can see what, what's going on with you. And, yeah. and I'm going to uh, go ahead and uh, want, I want to say goodbye to you and I want to thank you, but I'm going to play another song um, okay. um, for the, for the channel. So people get um, from, from the record that we uh, talked about. What song are you going to play? Do you know? Uh, let's see. I think we, we, uh, we talked about, um, uh, okay, from the brother Sal and the Devil May Care. Mm -hmm. What do you want to hear off that album? Uh, Poison in our water. You got it. That's what we'll do. We'll do that song. And then well, and that'll just kind of be the... Hey, Todd. Yeah. Let me give you an idea real quick. Uh, I'm going to give you one more little story. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. So I'm going to give you an introduction to this song. Okay. Awesome. So poison or water was not something that I had in my head. I didn't even know that I was going to write that song. I was out like at, at a dinner, hanging out with a friend and a man, old black man walked up to me and said, Hey man, you play music. And I said, yes, I do. And he said, I think I saw you play in Dallas, Texas, actually deep Ellum, which is a suburb of Dallas kind of like a, the rapper suburb of Dallas. I saw you play this honky tonk in Texas. And uh, I'm not a songwriter. He introduced himself. I'm not a songwriter, but I've had a song idea in my head for years and years and years. And I thought when I saw you play, that dude could write the song, but I didn't get to catch you after the show. And it's sort of fortuitous that I'm seeing here on the street in LA. And I said, that is fortuitous. I wonder how that came to be. And he said, I have no idea, but I just recognize you. And I said, okay, cool. Why don't you give me the song idea? And he's like, it's not even a melody. I just have a line. And the friend I was with kind of la was laughing at all of this or whatnot. And I go, okay, give me the line. And he said, you know how the human body is like 80% water? I said, yeah. He goes, you know that a woman has a tiny bit more water in her makeup of the body than a man does. He said, it ain't that much. It's a tiny little bit. But I swear that little bit that a woman's got more than a man is poison. Right? And I started laughing, thinking like this guy's like some sort of comedian. He goes, no, nah, check it. I love, my, this is what he said, I love my little girl, but someone put poison in the water. And I was like, oh, man. What a great line. He's like, I figured you could do like a blues song or something about it. I said, okay, great. Emery was his name. Emery Alexander. And I said, nice to meet you, man. It, we had another little bit of small talk and he walked on his way. Never saw him again. I talked to him once or twice. Like a year later, I was dating this girl and I did not like her. Ooh. And I, uh, I woke up. And it was pouring rain outside, and I went out and I wrote this song, Poison Our Water. It took me at least a year to get to the place where this man's idea popped back into my head about, like, there's something about this girl I don't like. Mm. Oh, yeah, she probably has poison in her water, right? <laughs> and then I wrote this song. And again, very easy. And it just came about from some passerby, some kind stranger who just decided to stop and say, I think that you could use this. He picked you out. He picked yeah. you out to uh, write the song me out. in his head. Yeah. That is awesome. That's a great story. Yeah, I man. love that. That's amazing how things like that happen. And then the way you guys met up again, you know, you know, halfway yep. across the country. That is so cool. Very cool. Well, with that, I'll go ahead and play the song. But I want to thank you, Sal, so much. for. Thanks for having me, Todd. No, it's my pleasure. I ple my pleasure, totally. It's been a joy talking with you, and I've enjoyed the conversation immensely. Thank my you man. so much. And uh, I'll keep, keep an eye out, and I'm, I'll put some links and things like yeah. that. People can find uh, your music so they can uh, listen to it with a click. And sure. Hopefully, we'll get you some more, um, some more attention. If I can get some. Followers, all of it, sure. Yeah. yeah. All right, man. Well, thank you so much. And I look forward to hearing from you again. And I appreciate your time. Uh, it's been awesome. Thank you, brother. All right. We'll see you later. Yes, sir. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm. Have a good one. Uh-huh. Bye. Bye-bye. All right.
Let's see. Okay, so that was awesome. That was uh, Brother Sal. And um, we're going to go ahead and play his song right now. We'll pull that up. Do it right this time. Okay, so here it is, Poison in the Water from his Brother Sal and the Devil May Care band. Here you go.
Wow. That was super cool. Yeah, Brother Sal, that was awesome. Wow, well, I got to thank him for being on today. That was a great conversation. Um, just love hearing his stories and the, his insights on music. Super awesome. Hey, thank you for watching. I appreciate you. And uh, look, if, if you like this uh, format that's going on, give me a like and uh, subscribe to the channel. It really helps because it's not just helping me, but it's helping these people that I'm also trying to promote. And uh, these musicians that uh, could use some love in different ways, the way the music industry is these days, it's hard to make money, especially when, uh, you know, you're, you know, you're not a top pop idol or whatever. Um, so, uh, you know, participate in what we're doing here. I would love to have you in the community and uh, comment, make comments and subscribe. Plus uh, that bell is super important. I mean, it hardly means anything to subscribe unless you push the bell. That way you get notified. Also, there's a couple ways if you're interested in um, helping the channel out. Um, I do have the, the Life Boost coffee. There's a link in the description where you can order some uh, delicious organic coffee that is like real coffee. It's not the commercialized stuff that you get at Starbucks or in the grocery store. This is like real good coffee. And uh, Patreon too. Patreon is a big one. This is where I'm going, uh, where I'm putting a lot of other music stuff on the channel, um, like reviews and, and reactions and things like that as well. So um, the, thing with, the thing with putting music on YouTube, um, it's like when I play music, um, you get like copyright infringements and things like that. So I'm not sure how much of that I'm going to do on this part. It might just kind of go back to just talking without the music, but I love having the music as part of this, but in for the future longevity of the show and the monetization of the show, I don't want to have a bunch of strikes, copyright strikes because I'm playing other people's music. I don't, I don't want money for it. I don't mind that. I, I don't want money for other people's music. That's not what I'm talking about, but I'm just talking about in the future for my purposes and, and what I want to do with the channel. Uh, so there's that. There's also the Patreon is where I can do some of that and we'll see how things go with YouTube and, and things like that. But um, using Spotify is not ne necessarily a great thing because they'll, they'll claim the copy on it and uh, they'll get the monetization. And then also if you want to, uh, participate besides Patreon. I do have a, um, a PayPal button there. You can just click and donate if you wanted to, but don't worry about it. It's not a big deal. Uh, I'm doing this out of the, uh, just out of my own passion for music and, uh, and broadcasting. And, and uh, I just want to, I just want to do it. I just want to share uh, the music with, with as many people as I can. So I want to thank you again for, uh, for participating and, and for listening. And Sal was a great interview. He had a very interesting person and what a talent he is. Uh, just so amazing uh, pianist and, and vocalist and songwriter. Super awesome to have him jump on here with us and just to have a whole hour of just conversation. So that was awesome. All right, well, we got more to come. I've got guests lined up and just as interesting as, uh, as uh, the last few have been. So um, stay tuned and remember, subscribe and all that stuff. And uh, let's, uh, let's keep this thing going. All right, so... Well, I'll talk to you soon. This is Todd Ledbetter from All Music, and we will catch you next time. Thanks. Bye-bye.